kind of had this perspective of Christianity as people who were either picture perfect and kind of born into this sweet existence or hypocrites who would hurt those of us who didn't belong. I spent the majority of my childhood growing up in South Central Los Angeles and lived in a home with chronic domestic violence and just a lot of survival mode and a lot of instability. One day when my mom was walking us into our elementary school, there was caution tape and police officers, and I saw in between the crowd that there was a body on the ground underneath the picnic bench and a pool of blood. And so my mom uh, decided to pull us out of that school and lied about our address to get us into a school in a very affluent area. And so we ended up going from an inner city school to one of the best schools in the country. There, everybody seemed to have these kind of picture-perfect families. And, you know, I would meet friends who their families were Christians and they'd go to church on Sundays. And it just created this image for me of what Christian families were supposed to look like. And I knew that that was not our family's experience. I had never read a Bible. I'd never been to church. I felt like Christianity was maybe for special people, and it felt like that wasn't me. When I was 14, I met my now husband and had, for the first time, this um, hope for a different way of life, and I shifted from not caring at all to feeling like if I could just work harder and do more and prove my worth that I could have this life that I had dreamed of. After we were married, our first son, he was born unexpectedly having complications and I was standing there alone in my hospital gown and just felt such extreme helplessness and that there was nothing that I could do. And that was the first time that I fell to my knees and just surrendered and prayed to this maybe God that I was still so unsure of and just said, you know, please let him be okay. And in the moment that I surrendered um, our firstborn son, I felt like I surrendered myself fully in that moment too. We met a couple who uh, we knew were Christians and were not quiet about their faith, but they also didn't push anything and just had really open conversations with us. And we knew that they were going to Austin Ridge Church and they had mentioned, you know, having us come visit. And she sent me this link of one of Brad's sermons and just saying, I think you'll like this one. It was just this glimpse into a leader of a church who was being vulnerable and talking about his own brokenness and talking about Jesus in a way that I felt like I could relate. We started attending Austin Ridge shortly after that and found a safe place to learn about the Bible in a way that didn't hold our brokenness against us. Jesus came to give his life so that we can be with him for eternity. He is a good shepherd who wants to protect us and be with us. God called us into the world of foster care and after fostering for 19 months and adopting our daughter, we started Foster Village in 2016, and we've had the opportunity to serve thousands of children and families who are working to overcome abuse and neglect and brokenness and domestic violence and all the same things that Jesus has walked with us through. When Jesus says, I am the door, to know that I have a good, good father who has invited me into his presence so that 
he can lay at the gate for me is um, the greatest gift. Morning, church. How we doing? I love Crystal's story. I love how easy it is to send someone a link to a sermon and say, hey, why don't you check this out? I mean, it, God moves through his word, and it's, it's not even about the speaker behind the pulpit. It's about God's word. It, it changes lives. And so I'm grateful for Crystal to tell her story. And um, as she said, looking for a church that's not perfect, filled with perfect people. If you're looking for a perfect church, please don't come here. You, you will mess us up. We got a thing going. Um, we are not perfect. We've got issues. We got struggles just like everybody else. But we do submit here and trust in a perfect God, a God who changes our hearts from the inside out. And, and he does that. And we believe that he can change anyone. If you have your Bibles, as, as Stephen said, turn to John 10. We'll pick up there in our series on John. John 10. I'm going to start in verse 22. At that time, let's stop there for a minute. <laughs> At what time? So context is always huge when you study your Bible. So we just studied the 21 verses before this on Father's Day about being the good shepherd, about being the door. This is about two months later, okay? And he's gonna say, he, I don't believe John ever wastes details. He says it's the feast of dedication taking place in Jerusalem. It was winter. And the fact that he says it is winter is kind of odd for a detail in the Bible. And I really see John saying, you need to understand that it was winter in, in the, the mission of Jesus. He is headed to the cross here in a few months. It's also winter in the spiritual lives of the spiritual leaders, which he's been dialoguing with for the, for the chapters to come. He's going to give them another opportunity in this text. Uh, and he's at the Feast of Dedication, which I'll talk about in a second. Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. So Solomon's temple was this beautiful porch with huge Concrete pillars, columns, a beautiful place to watch in the cool time of the year. And, and I've heard golfers say this, that the definition of golf is a good walk spoiled. That's exactly what they're doing. They're spoiling Jesus' walk. These guys are going to come, they're going to surround Jesus, and they're going to confront him about something. And he's going to give an answer. It's the right answer. It's the true answer. But like many, they don't like his answer, so they don't like him because the answer he gives. What is Feast of Dedication? If you ever read or heard about Feast of Lights, same feast, uh, we call it today Hanukkah. And so the Feast of Dedication, take you back to 170 B.C. 170 B.C., there was a man ruling this area, Antiochus Epiphanes. And Antiochus wanted to Hellenize the whole Jerusalem area. He wanted to take Greek and Rome thought and put it together, and he wanted all the, uh, the Jewish people to follow his Hellenization of the people. So here's what Antiochus does. He goes into the temple, and he desecrates it. He takes the priests. He causes them to, to eat pork, which was against their dietary code in the Old Testament. He took a pig and sacrificed it on the altar in the Holy of Holies, which totally desecrated the temple as well. He took the rooms where the priests would prepare for the sacrifices and he made it a brothel. He made a mockery of the temple. Again, this is 170 BC. And there was a priest at the time, Matthias, who had a son, Judas Maccabeus. And these two guys says, no, we're not gonna let this happen, not on our watch. And so Judas Maccabeus goes and defeats Antiochus and they reestablish the temple in 164 BC. And so they come up with this understanding of we need to celebrate and never forget what the temple is here for. And so they came up with something called the Feast of Dedication or the Feast of Lights. If you were a, a Jewish home, you would have eight candles in your window, in your home during this festival. It would last eight days. And it was a remembrance that God resides with his people in the temple and that a Messiah is going to come. And so this desecration is never going to happen again. When this Messiah comes, he will come, as the Bible says, rule with an iron rod, and he would reestablish Jerusalem as the center of God's universe, if you will, and the Jewish people would reign with him forever, and he would crush the enemies, the Greeks, the Romans, and everybody else. And they were waiting on this Messiah to come. So let's fast forward to, at that time, the feast is taking place, Jesus is walking in the wintertime, it's a beautiful day, and his walk is about to get spoiled. You guys follow me? Okay, that's so weak. I'm 11 o'clock, I expect it at 9.15, they're all asleep. You guys with me? All right, good. 
I like that. Verse 24, so the Jews gathered around him and said to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Now, I read that this week and I thought, you've got to be kidding me. He has said it over and over and over. And they say, if you're the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them. By the way, it says the Christ. Y'all realize that Christ is not Jesus' last name, right? It's not Jesus Christ, meaning first name, last name. He is literally, it's a title, Jesus the Messiah, Jesus the Christ, Jesus the sent one. And so they're asking, are you the one that we've been waiting on to rule and reign so we can rule with you? Are you the Christ? Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you are not part of my flock. He tells them twice, the issue is not, I'm not answering you plainly. The issue is you don't like the answer. The issue is not knowledge. The issue is you continue to reject me as who I claim to be. And you are, the reason that you don't understand who I am, he says, because you are not part of my flock. It's another way of saying that you're not my sheep. It's another way of saying that you're not one of my children, and because you can't hear with spiritual ears, even though I speak uh, clearly, I act in a plain way, you don't like it because you can't hear it spiritually because your spiritual ears are closed. So they say, tell us plainly, he says, I did tell you. Verse 25, you don't believe. Verse 26, you don't believe. Now what is he talking about? You don't believe what? If you don't believe who Jesus is, maybe you'll believe what he's done. He's turned water into wine at this point. He has uh, healed a blind man from birth. No one ever done that from birth. And this man's healed from birth being blind. He's healed a, a, a man's son who was somewhere else. So he's Lord over time and space. He doesn't have to be there to do a healing. He just says it and it happens. Uh, he, he, he fed 5,000 out of a lunchbox. He, he continued, he, a lame man walked. Uh, he walked on water. All of which only God can do. The, New Test, or the Old Testament talked about when the Messiah comes, he'll do certain things. Some of the things it talked about was he will control the wind and the water. Jesus did that. The lame will walk. Jesus did that. The blind will see. Jesus did that. He will, he will bring up people from the dead, which we're going to see that next week in chapter 11. Jesus did that. So Jesus did divine things. He said he was divine. And he says to these men, you don't believe me. Saying you're divine doesn't make you divine. But when you can start walking on water and healing lame people and they walk and blind people and they see, that's a little different. Uh, a lot of people have claimed to be divine. I, I was listening to the story about Jim Jones, a, a cult leader out in California several decades ago. Jim Jones created this movement, moved his church from the Midwest out to California, and he claimed to have the gift of healing one day, which is an interesting gift to me. And so literally what they did, and they had this woman in the story in this, in this uh, documentary talking who was a follower and who believed, this woman actually put something in her drink. She passes out unconscious. While she's out, they put a cast on her right leg. She comes to and they tell her, got some bad news for you, we got some good news. Bad news is you, you, you blacked out, you fell down, you, you got a broken leg. But good news is we have the best doctors around and they've already fixed it, it's already set, the cast is on, you're gonna be fine. And so she was blown away that they had done this and taken care of her. Then Jim stands up a couple weeks later and talks about having the gift of healing. He calls this woman forward in the cast and pretends to heal her. They take a saw out and they cut the cast off. And the woman thought the whole time she had a broken leg. So then, because she didn't have a broken leg, they take the cast off. She starts jumping around rejoicing because she's been healed. So just because someone says they're divine doesn't mean anything, but if someone walks on water, you may wanna pay some attention. Jesus says, you do not believe because you're not part of my flock. You don't believe because you don't wanna believe, you don't wanna follow me, and guys, that's the same truth today. People do not choose not to believe Jesus because there's lack of evidence. People choose not to believe Jesus because they don't wanna follow Jesus. We don't want to stop being Lord of our lives, and we don't want to submit and yield our life to someone else. That's the real issue. It's not about evidence. We'll come up with philosophies and theories and evidential questions 
that we raise up, but those are all cop-outs because the real issue is I want to be Lord of my life. I want to be in charge. Same there, same here. Back in John chapter 5, Jesus says, how can you believe when you seek glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from God alone. So Jesus makes a statement that one of the big reasons why people won't believe is because they're about their own glory instead of giving glory to the Father. They're more concerned about what other people think than what God knows. So the issue is never evidence. The issue is our hardness of heart. Ephesians chapter four, verse 18, Paul says it this way, they are darkened in their understanding excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them because of the hardness of the heart. What Jesus is saying is, you're not a part of my flock because you will not repent, you will not follow me, you will not obey me. So the issue is not me being plain, the issue is your heart is darkened. He also says you're not part of my flock, which is, which is what Jesus is saying is this, you're not part of my elect chosen children. And a lot of people don't understand when we talk about election predestination. It's a very difficult topic. When you look at your Bible, when I look at my Bible, if I could just take for a minute, put aside what you think is true, let's talk about what the Bible says is true. Abraham, I choose you to go into another country. Through you, my seed will be blessed and I will create a nation through you and you will get land, seed, and blessing through you. Did Abraham choose God or did God choose Abraham? God chose Abraham. Moses, I want you to go to Egypt and you're gonna stand in front of the king and you're gonna say, let my people go and these are the signs I'll give you. Did God choose Moses? Did Moses choose God? Israel, you're gonna be my chosen people. Why not the Hittites? Why not the Amorites? Why not the Jebusites? Why not the Aggies? Why not, <laughs> why not all the sites? Because God's, in charge, he gets to make choices. That's what being God means. You choose who you want to choose. Why Abel and not Cain? Why Jacob and not Esau? It's all through the Bible. Why did he choose the Israelites? I have no idea. It's not the people I would have probably have chosen. He chose them. Why Matthew? I'm sure there were other tax collectors. Why Matthew? Why did he choose Paul? There are a lot of other people that killed Christians and burned churches. What made Paul so special? Why not Judas? Why was Judas one that betrayed him? Why didn't John betray him? You ask these questions and God sovereignly throughout the scriptures chooses and what he's saying here is the same thing to these men. The reason you don't hear is because you're not part of my flock. And I love this text because a lot of people wanna argue about this issue with me and I can just say, hey, this is what Jesus taught. It doesn't matter what I think, it's what Jesus taught. Now, pastor, do you believe in free will? Absolutely. I believe you chose to place your faith and trust in Christ one day. But the issue is not free will, church. The issue is options. Before Jesus softened my heart, which was darkened, the Bible says, Ephesians 2, 1, dead in my trespasses. Dead people can't make spiritual decisions. God has to do a work for my ears to become spiritual ears so I can hear spiritual words and it clicks in my heart and then I actually respond to that in faith, and that faith that I respond in is actually even the gift of God because I have no faith in anything other than myself before Jesus gives me a new heart. God works first. The part of the role I played is I got lost, and then God gives me the ability to hear with spiritual ears what I could not hear before. I imagine the first time you heard the gospel, you didn't come to Christ. I imagine you heard pieces of it or bits of it or you saw it in different ways, but at some point, one day, it clicked. Someone like me or a friend shared the gospel with you, you heard a podcast, you listened on the radio or the Facebook or whatever, and it clicked, and you're like, why did that make sense? I've been in church my whole life. Why did it click? It wasn't because you were smarter in that moment. It was because God in that moment gave you spiritual ears to hear what you never would have understood if he didn't open up your ears and your heart. God does a work. We respond by faith. The gift of faith is also a gift from God. For it's by grace you've been saved. This not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Let's see any man should boast. So what part of salvation do you and I play? We got lost. Salvation is a work of God. So I don't use the words Calvinism or Arminianism because people, it confuses them and they start thinking in theological categories. I don't like theological categories because the Bible's not always a clear category. Here's what I say at the ridge, what we say at the ridge, that we believe God is sovereign in the salvation process of all people. 
that God is sovereign in the salvation process. God did a work in my life and in your life to enable us to hear the words, for it to make sense, to connect to our heart, and give us the gift of faith to respond to him. And he's saying to these people right here, you're not of my flock. Look at verse 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. They follow me. That verse right there is kind of what Paul talks about in Romans 8. Everybody loves Romans 8, 28, right? For we know all things work to the good for those who call according to God's purposes. Verse 30 is pretty amazing too. We just never talk about it. Verse 30 says this, whom God predestined. And people say, what does that really mean in the Greek? It means predestined in the Greek. Whom God predestined. Those he foreknew, whom he foreknew, he called, whom he called, he justified. All those words in Romans 8, 30 are past tense. You and I had nothing to do with those words. I had nothing to do with God calling me and me being able to hear him and him justifying me and him sanctifying me and one day I'll have nothing to do with him glorifying me. Folks, salvation is all the work of the Lord. We serve a big God and we have little hearts and he does supernatural things in that moment. Left to myself, I'm always gonna do what my flesh tells me to do. Left to myself, I'm not gonna submit to God. I'm gonna submit to myself because I'm in charge. It's been true all of history. I love the verse, this is how I named my daughter Lydia. God opened the heart of Lydia to respond to the things of Paul. That's God doing a work. Luke uh, wrote in Acts 38, as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. John 6, all the Father gives to me will come to me. The one who comes to me, I will not cast out. I will raise him on the last day. How can you tell if someone is the real deal Christian? People come to me all the time and say, I get asked this question a lot. Is it possible I can lose my salvation? I'm gonna give you the short answer. No, not biblically. You can't lose something that you didn't earn to obtain it. Because it's not yours to give back. It's a free gift of grace. If you earned your salvation, then you could lose it, and I assure you that you and I would lose it. <laughs> but because we didn't earn it or obtain it, it was given to us, it's not ours to lose. Your salvation is as, as secure as the love of God for you. When God stops loving you and he's not true to his promises, then you can lose your salvation. Some of us grew up in churches, we were taught, if you act bad or have a season of acting bad, you can lose your salvation. People come to me and say, I think I've lost my salvation. I'll say, why do you think that? Because I, I'm having some thoughts I'm struggling with or I did something I'm struggling with or sometimes I just don't want to pray. Sometimes I don't feel like reading my Bible and it bothers me. I assure you, if that stuff bothers you, you probably have the Holy Spirit in your life. Because sin does not bother you if you are not walking with God. That stuff, you will not be bothered by that stuff. But when you have the Holy Spirit in your life, it bothers you, it concerns you. That's good. We want everyone to feel good at church. I want us to be bothered sometimes by our sin too. I want us to be concerned. Do I really walk with God? Verse 28, he talks about true change and true security. Look at it. Verse 28, I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. True change True security, can you lose your salvation? No, because you didn't earn your salvation. Can I lose by my bad works what I did not gain by good works? Can I lose what God did? No, he says, look at it, I give them eternal life, they'll never perish. I think an English teacher would have cut off some points there for John. He says the same thing in two different ways. I give you eternal life, you'll never perish. You don't need to say part two there. To say, I give you eternal life, that means you'll never die, right? But he says it again, you'll never perish because no one can snatch them. He doesn't say you'll never perish because I think by your good works it'll outweigh the bad. He didn't say you'll never perish because I think compared to most people, you're, you're good. The curve will get you into heaven, curve busters. He says you'll never perish, not anything to do with you, but because no one can take this out of my hand, it's mine. You can't only lose your salvation when God stops keeping his promises. So we trust in a good shepherd. We know it's not of us. And that's a lot of peace in my life. Because if my salvation's up to me, I'm in trouble. Every Monday I'm in trouble, probably. I get a little better as the week goes on and get closer to the sermon, right? God's work does. But man, Mondays, that's when you don't put the Jesus is Lord sticker in your car. You're going to drive too fast on BK. 
we struggle, right? Let's go to the next verse. This, this argument continues. Verse 29, my father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one's able to snatch them out of the father's hand. I and the father are one. Now verse 30 where it says, I and the father are one, that's really what gets Jesus killed. That's, that's the thing right there. When you claim to be God, in essence, in mission, on purpose, they're gonna pick up stones and they're gonna kill you because it's considered blasphemy. He says, I and the Father are one. Look at verse 31. The Jews picked up stones again. They're really bad at this stone thing. They've done it several times. <laughs> Jesus is still talking. They picked up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father, for which of them are you going to stone me? The Jews answered him, it is not for a good work that we're going to stone you, but for blasphemy. When he says the Father and here are one, that's why we're gonna kill you. Because you being a man make yourself God. So a lot of people again are confused saying Jesus never really claimed to be God. You guys have seen with me all through John, every sermon Jesus in the text is claiming to be God. It's just people don't want him to be God, so they say he never really said it, so it gives them an out. Jesus is claiming to be God. And, and honestly, if that's not what Jesus was trying to clearly say, you think maybe when they start picking up rocks, maybe he tries to articulate clearly what he really meant? Like, that'd be a good moment, right? Like, no, 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 guys, you misunderstand me. Let me re-explain. No, Jesus does not backtrack on why they're picking rocks up. Matter of fact, he's gonna take it further and explain it further. Look back at the text with me. Verse 34, Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law, I said, you are gods? Now, gods there in your Bible, does it have little g or capital G? Little g. I'm explaining a minute what that means. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came and scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said I'm the son of God? There have been cults have started on that verse out of context. The Bible says that you and I are little g gods, and so he expects us to reign as gods while we're on earth. That's not what that verse is saying. What he's doing right there is he's quoting from a psalm, Psalm 82. Let's turn there. Psalms right in the middle of your Bible. Just close your Bible, open the middle, you'll hit Psalms. Psalms 82. This is what he's quoting. Love the sound of Bible pages. Psalms 82. Let's kind of walk through this psalm briefly. Psalm 82 starts, God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. God's there is plural, little g. In the midst of anyone else in authority, anyone else that's in charge, anyone else that's on top, he holds them in judgment. He has the ability alone to judge. Verse two, how long will you judge unjustly? Now, he's not talking to God anymore. He's talking about those people in places of authority that have been there to represent big G God. He's talking to the little G gods. Verse two, how long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Give justice to the weak and the fatherless, maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute, rescue the weak and the needy, deliver them from the hand of the wicked. So what I wrote beside verse two, three, and four in Psalm 82 is mission. The mission that God ever puts any, big G God, anyone in a place of authority or leadership is that they would fulfill verse two, three, and four. You are given authority to represent God and to care for people, to serve people, to love people, to look out for their best interests. But instead, the spiritual leaders during that day were doing the opposite. They were taking money from people. They didn't care about people. They weren't looking out for their best interests. And that should sound familiar to what we've been reading in John because the spiritual leaders were the same thing. So he quotes from this Psalm saying, you're all little G gods. You've been placed in authority and no one has authority unless God gives that authority because God holds all authority and you are not doing this well. You're not fulfilling verse two, three, and four. Look at verse five. They have neither knowledge or understanding. They walk about in darkness. Just because someone has a spiritual title of leadership doesn't mean they're spiritual. Just because someone says they have authority doesn't mean that they don't walk in darkness. 
And what he says here after that, verse five is interesting, all the foundations of the earth are shaken. Biblically speaking, as the king went spiritually, so went the nation. Today, practically, as our leaders go, so go the nation. What God is saying here is when you've got leaders that are supposed to represent me and help people and take care of people, and instead they walk in their own agenda, their own darkness, the whole foundation of the world gets shook because the wrong people are in power. I said you are gods, little g, sons of the most high, all of you. Nevertheless, like men, you shall die and fall like any prince. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all the nations. Let's go back to John 10. So I hope you're following this. So John is talking on this beautiful porch on a beautiful winter afternoon. They're saying, just tell us plainly who you are. He's like, I told you, it's not about evidence. You just don't believe because you don't want me to be God. I don't, I don't meet your expectations. And so now he's saying, he calls them little gods. You've been placed in authority. The only reason you have authority is because the one who holds all authority has placed you in that position. And instead of helping people and loving people and serving people, you've done the opposite. And God will judge you. What he's saying is, I will judge you. And I have the power to judge everyone. Now go with me to verse 37. If I am not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works, that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I'm in the Father. I think what Jesus is doing right here is giving the spiritual leaders one more invitation to repent. He's giving them one. From this point on, John is, is, is marching to the cross. They've already made their mind up. We're gonna kill this guy. He's giving them one more opportunity to repent. And they say, wait a minute, Brad, I thought we don't have free will like that, that God has to do something for us to believe. He calls all to come to know him. Some, he opens their spiritual ears. Left alone, none of us will ever hear spiritually. The fact that God saves anybody means that God is more graceful than he ever needs to be and that we deserve him to be. So people will say then, what about the person who hasn't heard? I always look at them and say, but you've heard. And now you get to be a part of taking that message to those who haven't heard. So don't worry about someone who hasn't heard. You gotta be concerned about the fact that you're hearing me talk right now. And so really when you come to church on Sunday morning, when I stand up here on a Sunday morning, you and I are saying, God, we choose to be accountable to everything we hear in truth today and live up to it because we believe your word has authority. That's a scary proposition when you think about church. That's probably a meeting you don't want to come late to. <laughs> like there are people, I often, I don't say this, but I think this, why do you come and you're gonna live like everybody else lives and you don't ever want to change? Like either what I preach here at the Ridge really what Paul says and Jesus says, would bother you to the extent that you wouldn't want to come back, which makes sense to me, or your heart starts to crumble under the truth and authority of God's word. And he's looking at these guys, and I think he's giving them one more opportunity. What kinds of works has he done? He's done works of creation, water to wine, he's commanded the winds and the waves, he's given, I mean, he could go through the works. When the Messiah comes, the blind will see, check. When, they, when he comes, the lame will walk, check. When he comes, he'll feed them again the way he fed the multitudes in the wilderness. I did that with 5,000 with a lunchbox, check. When he comes, he'll walk on water, check. And they're saying, would you just plainly tell us who you are? I've told you. The issue is not evidence, the issue is hardness of heart. Look at verse 38, I'm sorry, verse 39. Again, they sought to arrest him, but he escaped from their hands. They're so bad at all this. <laughs> He went away again across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing at first, and there he remained. And many came to him, and they said, John did no sign, but everything that John said about this man was true, and many believed in him there. One of the reasons why I think John has his last few verses is, there's always someone rejecting the truth, and there's always someone receiving the truth, so don't ever get discouraged when you're sharing the truth. Like when you're sharing the truth to someone, and it takes 50 steps for them to have spiritual ears, maybe you're step 42. So you don't walk away from that, thing, that, that opportunity saying, well, I blew that, I failed that. No, you speaking, you're not gonna fail it. Like, it's not up to you. People don't come to Christ because you say the right words. People come to Christ because the Spirit of God changes them from the inside out. Our job is to cast seed, we're sowers, we throw seed. We don't know who God's children are, we just throw seed to everybody. And God does what he does. 
They, that happens here on Sunday morning. I don't know what you guys are all going through, even though you come up to me and say, did my wife send you an email this week? You kept looking at me when you were saying that. I try to scan quickly in here, so I'm not looking at you one person. I don't know what's going on in your life. God does, and God takes the word. If there's, I don't know, 650 people in here. There's 650 different situations, and God's word can speak to them in 650 different ways. That's why this book, the Bible says, is living and active. It's sharper than a double-edged sword. That's why you don't come to church when we read Hamlet. Great book, but it's not active and sharper than a double-edged sword. It's not able to penetrate the divine soul and spirit joint and marrow. It's not able to judge the thoughts, the intentions, and the attitudes of the heart. So we say that good biblical preaching does this. When you come, and there's, there's weeks that I come, I feel afflicted. It comforts me. The word of God comforts the afflicted. Some of you come in going, I'm good, everything's great. I didn't pray much this week because I'm good right now. I didn't have any final exams this week, I'm good. So preaching in your case afflicts the comfortable. And the word of God does that at the same moment. Does that make sense? That's why the word of God is active and living. You know, as a pastor, one of the things that I do is uh, funerals. I don't do as many funerals as I used to because I have a larger staff and, and they're, they're a great help when it comes to funerals. But sometimes I do funerals. Funerals are great. I think funerals are a gift. Now, it's sad when you've lost a loved one, so I'm not trying to say it's not. But the funeral is the one time where you and I stop and think about death. Think about life. We think about, okay, I'm so-and-so old. What if that's my paper? What if that's my picture? What would people be saying about me if I died? You know, what would the testimonies be? Who would come? Who wouldn't come? Who would be, man, I'm glad that guy's out of here. Who would, who would be crying? Who would be celebrating a Tex-Mex place afterwards? Who? And we think about these things at a funeral. A funeral's a gift. Let me tell you why a funeral's a gift. Because it causes me to remember and think about the promises of God to me after death. The Bible talks a lot about it. The Bible says this, if we have hoped in Christ only for this life, we are people most to be pitied. I've done funerals, I've gone to funerals where a non-Christian dies, and all they can talk about is what they accomplished while they were alive, because it's over. But when you can stand up there and say, this person, we didn't lose them today, we know exactly where they are, you can't lose someone, you know where they are. And let me tell you, they start in real life now, they're actually happier than they've ever been, they have peace more than they've ever had, and they never have to worry about this old place again, and they're not haunting your house because they're not thinking about you anymore. They are now in front of their savior. The eyes of fire are face to face with them, and they are blown away right now. But if I do a funeral for someone else, I'm like, such a shame. They had so many opportunities. They never yielded their hearts. Would you yield your heart to this? I started evangelizing at funerals where I don't have anything else to say about this person. It's hard to do a funeral with someone you don't like, by the way. Or if you do a funeral and this guy was just mean, this woman was just ornery, like a pterodactyl, and you're doing this funeral, and literally, I've done funerals like that where I'll go up there and I'm like, I'll talk about it for about three minutes. I'm like, let me just run to Jesus now. I wanna give you an invitation. But man, when you got someone sitting there, and I, I keep pointing here, there's no dead person up here. <laughs> <laughs> but when you're standing there and you're going, let me tell you something, if, if so-and-so were here, standing right here with you, this is what they'd want you to hear, that Jesus Christ loves you more than your wildest dreams can imagine. He's done everything for you to be invited as his sheep, and today would you consider him being your master instead of you being in charge, because life doesn't work well when you and I are in charge. Would you yield today? That's what they would want me to say. So I believe funerals are a great gift. I love it when Jesus asked his disciples, he said some hard things which we're gonna get to. It says many of the disciples left. He looked at Peter and says, you wanna leave too? Peter says, where would we go? You hold the keys, the words of life. Where would we go? Like Jesus, if you're not real, I'm done. But if you are real, I gain everything. And I believe he's real because he's changed my life. So, what does this mean for us today? When Jesus says, 
I give you eternal life and you'll never perish. Here's what Jesus is saying. There's two destinies for all people. The Bible's very clear. One are called the sheep, and the others are called the goat. The goats are not the greatest ever to play their certain sport, that's not that kind of goat. You got the sheep, you got the goat. Jesus says, on my right will be the sheep, on my left will be the goat. He will turn to the, the goats and say, depart from me for I never knew you. And he says, in that day many will say, but I did this for you, I did that for you, I went to church, I served, I gave, I, I, I was a nice person, I tried to help people. I never knew you, meaning this, I never had a relationship with you. Yeah, you did all these things, but it wasn't about my glory, it's about your glory. He'll say, depart from me, for I never knew you. And then it says he'll turn to his sheep on the right, and he'll say, enter your rest, that you will be with me for all eternity. He says, in Revelation, all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. And in that moment, when you and I are there, that promise of they can never be snatched out of my hand will be a pretty cool promise. The same hand that grabs Peter and pulls him out of the water is the same hand that I rest in the day that has nothing to do with my conduct or behavior. It's about Jesus' perfect life. You can't lose it. Those who hear the voice of Jesus and follow him are gripped by the most powerful hand in the universe, amen? So today, my, my, my beg of you is you've never placed your faith and trust in Christ, you would do so today. All I can offer you is there is more historical validity to this book and the witnesses of this book than any other book in the history of the world. So at least you have to say, that book's different, I need to check it out, at the least. If you say, well, I'm agnostic, I don't know if there's a God, what that means is you're open to finding out and you're gonna search it out. So be a smart agnostic. If you're here today and you say, I'm an atheist, there's not a God, you just made an absolute truth of saying you have absolute understanding and wisdom that you know there's not a God, you need to recheck that statement. You and I can't stop our hair from falling out. And you're making a statement that there is no God. Well, there is a God who says, I am real, and I became flesh and I dwelt among you so that where I go, you may go there as well. If it were not so, I would have told you, but I go to prepare a place for you. And he says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you what? Rest. My favorite word in the Bible, rest. Because everything in this culture is not that. Let me pray for you. Lord, I'm so grateful to be with my friends here at Austin Rose today and to talk about such lofty things. And Father, I don't fully understand election, predestination, salvation, sovereignty. I don't have to have all the answers. I just know you. I just believe you're in charge. I trust that. You changed my life. You changed the life of my wife. You changed my kids' lives. And I've seen so many of my friends here at the Ridge, you changed their lives. Lord, I pray that today there might be one person he says, you know what, I want rest. I want peace. And there'll be one person today to say, God, I believe Jesus was the Messiah. I believe he was God in the flesh. And I wanna follow him. I want you in charge of my life. I trust you today. I know I'm a sinner and I know apart from you, I'll never spend eternity with you. Or that one person today would say that prayer. And that you'd get that person to come to someone on our team and say, hey, I prayed that prayer that Brad prayed today and we could help you grow and help you be discipled. Father, I believe that the Christian life is the most radical, unbelievable, on the edge way to live life. There's nothing boring about holiness, it is crazy fun. And we're not missing anything, we're not missing out on anything this world has to offer. So Lord, today, May this be the day of salvation for someone. Let's sing your name we pray. Amen.